So next up we have, uh, uh, I think of, you'll find a very uh, inspiring Calgarian. Uh, his, uh, his name is David Brunning, also known as the Kid Bilo. And uh, he said that ever since he was a young guy, he uh, always wanted to be drawing and doodling, and this turned into uh, uh, a career and a passion for things visual arts and graffiti. Um, he, his work is now adorning the walls of homes of Jerome McGinla, PJ Golf uh, star Stephen Ames, uh, if you've seen the Alley Burger uh, food truck, that's his work, uh, and many, many other pieces all around uh, this city. Um, I had a brief chat with him on the phone a few weeks ago. I, 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 was, I was moved in minutes just, just speaking with, with David. He was just incredibly inspiring, incredibly passionate about people finding their passion and following it. And so without any further ado, please join me in welcoming David Brunning. Wow, is this, uh, this on here? Are we good? Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, this is kind of a, a, a nice honor to be up here speaking in front of all of you. I, uh, I don't have a big degree behind my name. I'm a student of my culture. And uh, like you said, since I was young, I would draw on almost anything or talk all the time. I think that's from my mother. So it's kind of fitting that I'm up here in front of you and I'm speaking today, and it's kind of fitting that I pursued my passion, which was to pursue my artwork full time. And that came through a series of events. So I kind of want to share with you this whole idea. Well, let's just go with what I am right now, but I want to share with you this idea of if. And my question today is if you were to pursue your passion, and first of all, dig up and find what your passion is, if you were to pursue that, what would that look like? Because there's a lot of stuff that stirs inside of you every single day, even for years. There's a lot that, that stays inside of you that's dormant that you don't even know about. And if it's triggered, that's a scary thing. You could leave your job downtown like I did. <laughs> you take all your RRSPs out of your bank like I did. <laughs> you could go into debt 20K four times like I did. You could sell every vehicle you owned like I did. So, that's me. <laughs> that's davidbrunning.com. That's kind of just a fun little picture in Toronto. I came as I am. I wear t-shirts and jeans. I used to wear suit jackets. I still have two boss suits in my closet. The rest are gone. But, uh, and I, I have nothing against suits. They're fantastic. So, but I just came like I am because this is most comfortable for me. And I love letters. That's what I work with every day. I write, I speak, I blog. This is an interesting idea, Rich Beyond Bills. I had this concept, being in a city as affluent as Calgary, to do this whole thing about the wealth that we have here. And having my pockets kind of empty a lot of the time, <laughs> which is kind of funny, I was like, what makes me rich? Well, me. That's what makes me rich. That's what I believe. Because wealth comes and goes, but the wealth inside stays. And if you build that and cultivate that, it's, uh, it's good for life. That's the wonderful, lit up from behind, angelic view of the guy you buy art from. <laughs> so that's the kidbelow.com. There is uh, a fabulous project, if anyone knows. East Village, uh, wonderful people. Uh, Chris Allenberger was uh, fantastic in his team to work for, and that was painted. That's the biggest mural that I've done. That's 32 feet high, 100 feet wide, done by myself. I've never painted a, a that big. That's like 24 feet high. <laughs> Just to do that, to stand on scaffolding, to stand on a big skyjack and to do that, to sit with a roller to do the... The, the A and the S and the T and to, to roll from, from the skyjack and come down like this and, and start seeing what you were doing. I could tell if I was off by an inch or two at 32 feet high. I had no idea that that was in my mind and in my body and I was capable of producing something to this size. I had no idea. But the challenge afforded me taught me that. Just like Dr. Feelgood you never know, right? You don't know what you're doing, you're just doing it. Well, that's kind of what I do. I love life. I love my life. And I love passion. I move by passion. 
There's another big face you might have seen when you head toward the Hyatt or, or Art Central. There's my big mug on the side of uh, Axis Contemporary Art. That was 06. This, uh, this is uh, 2008. Me and my friend Darcy painted this. This says Rise Above, and it's, it's just for people in downtown. I wanted to not paint my name. I don't paint my name a lot. I want to give back to the community, the people that walk the streets, the people that walk by. I want people to be encouraged. I want people to be lifted. I get to see my life through my eyes all the time, but I get to look into the eyes of so many others, and I see the droned out faces every day going to work and every day coming back and parking in the garage and back into the cave and cable TV on and don't talk to me, and I just got to, I got sick of that. There's no way. I'm not having that life. I don't want that life at all. That's not me. This is first in color. So these are just things that I do. If you want to see what I do, you can go to thekidbelow.com. That's great. But this is why I'm here. If you were to live your most full, heroic, passion-filled life, what would that look like? And a lot of you are probably thinking, well, I am too old to do that. And a lot of you are probably thinking, I have no idea how to do that. I broke it down into three things. If, broke into in foundation, the I, the F. The next, in formation. It's funny that we are in the information age. That's our realm, right? It's coming to us from everything. Open a magazine, you know, and advertising and internet and TV and you can't keep up with the information. I mean, if you're tweeting right now, good for you. This is great. We share it all the time. It doesn't stop. But it's funny how it says in formation. You're being formed by what you see, read, hear, dwell upon. It's forming who you are. And in future. So these are the three things I'm going to look at. I'll try to get this done in 15 minutes because, I mean, I think we're well over the time, but just bear with me. Thank you for your attention. In foundation, I don't even like the technology of PowerPoint. It's kind of funny to me. I like this technology because this is like the craziest thing. We make this stuff. This is what we get. This is what we have. This is this body and this mind and this heart. And I like that. Bouchine once said, um, you are not a great man if you have more mind than heart. And that has been a, a quote that I have stuck with for 32 years. Can't say that because I probably heard it like when I was 24 or something, but <laughs> let's just say that. If is a because. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Anyone? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. In all of our smarts and our wisdom, no one can answer that question. If your mom and dad made love, I know, don't think about it now. <laughs> you would become you. Because they got together, you're here. So if and because always work. It's a cycle. It never stops. If I go do this, because I did that. Well, guess what? In your foundation, any foundation, as builders know, if you're building or, or scientists or anything, a foundation is key. When I make a canvas, my foundation of that canvas is key. It's got to be strong. It's got to be good. The foundation of my life has got to be strong and good. But we don't often get to pick our foundation, do we? Who remembers being uh, zero uh, years old or just born or whatever, like a day old? Who remembers the nine months in the womb? Who remembers the first five years of their life? Ah. I remember I used to do this with cake and be like, ah. freaked out about touching cake. I hate messes. I hate it. And now I make them all over the place. Right? I put some stuff down here. It says, how, to get to, how do we get to where we are? What foundation was given to us? What was given to you at birth? We go from zero to five in 1,825 days. No. <laughs> days when you're a kid are like, uh, is it lunch yet? And now it's like bedtime. It gets faster as you get older. Right? But what was natural? What were you born into? I wasn't born into a wealthy family. I was born into a trailer park. Awesome. I was born with two parents. Eventually, there was four boys. I wasn't born with a super high IQ, and I wasn't born with uh, a lot of privilege. 
I learned how to draw because I wanted that kid's Twix bar in his lunch. Or I wanted that kid's juice box because my parents couldn't afford juice boxes and I had to have water at lunch. So I learned how to draw these cars. <laughs> Sports cars back in the 80s. <laughs> so I'd be in class doodling away, not doing, because I was like, I want that snack. That snack's going to be mine. So I learned at a very young age some things. But your foundation, if you want to take yourself back a little bit, what is your foundation? Oh, if I could just erase your adult lives for a second and just clear it up and bring you back to being a kid. Right? The kid below. I never want to lose that. Being a kid, ever. You can, I'll be 65 and hopefully be 65. I've lived a pretty crazy life, but I'll be 65 one day and hopefully still be a kid, be a child at heart. There's something beautiful about that. So what happened in those first five years of your life? What came natural? What was the foundation that was laid? Often we don't remember that, and therefore we can't even go back to that. It takes therapy. <laughs> it takes treatment. It takes, uh, you know, it's like big, big money. I charge you 250 bucks an hour, and let's talk about your past. And then you get out every, every single thing, and your spouse or your friends are like, do not go back. <laughs> like whatever they're trying to unearth, it's not worth 250 bucks an hour. Your foundation is key. Your foundation sets the game. I don't care if it's good or if it's bad. You're an adult, you take responsibility, you make it what it is, and if you need to go back to it, you visit it. I had to go back to it to visit it. But there's certain things that were there in the foundation that I can't ignore, right? In formation, I have constantly been formed my entire life. It's crazy. I look at my parents and I'm like, why did I get stuck with a mom that doesn't stop talking? And a dad that you can't tell his emotion on his face. Strong, strong man, poker face. Beautiful, loving, give of everything she has woman. Those are my parents. Why was my older brother an artist that blows my mind away? And my younger brother, Brian, a, a, a guy that's a guru with the computer and is self-taught. And my younger brother, Joel, um, a guy that, that, that is such a, a, a strong man. And, and, you know, why did that happen to me? All these things started to form into my life when I looked at my family and I looked at the things that were natural to me. Then my parents, you know, had to look at me and say, why does this kid draw on everything? He doesn't stop. Every desk I owned, every wall. Uh, and you know what's funny? I didn't start doing graffiti until I was 19. I was 19 years old. Crazy, right? I was a late bloomer. But there's something in me. When did I start journaling, though? When did I start using letters? I started writing when I was young. I couldn't stop. I did my first publication of a magazine called Kids World in grade six. I was the chief editor. It was on an Apple IIe. Rest in peace, Steve Jobs. It was fantastic. I was introduced to Apple a long time ago. I had no idea, though. I was writing, blogging. We have a natural thing in our foundation. We have natural things that occur throughout our lives. What's natural in your life? What do you get drawn to? Some of you might not even remember. Some of you might be, it might be right there for you today. Who knows? What is learned? And what's developed? See, I didn't jump into being an artist and go, oh man, I got this. I look back at my books and I go, wow, I, uh, whew, I don't want to paint that. Like, there's no way I'm going to show people that. I'm okay with that now. It's part of my history. It's part of all of our history. There's patterns that happen in your life. If I do this, because I did that, I'm here. I moved to Calgary in, in just before 2000, and I started working building bulletproof armor for the military. And then shortly after, I was asked to work at Joy Tomatoes. And, and, uh, and then I'm at Joy Tomatoes downtown and uh, going to college. I don't know why. As I, I didn't graduate high school. And I get to be up here with all these doctors. This is great. Education is, is something you learn. It's not necessarily through a textbook or through school. It's something, it's, it's an attitude toward life. You're always learning. Bring it in. You're always in formation. So all the information you have, bring in. That never stops. As soon as that stops, you're toast. You get old. Stay young. Be informed. Be grown. Be challenged, right? So there I am at college, and all of a sudden I'm like, this doesn't even work for me. What am I doing? So I stayed at the restaurant, and I started working in a skateboard shop and painting and this and that. What ended up happening 
was I gave out posters to friends because I just love to give. I still do. I love, but now it's different. I, it's like, here's a canvas. But back then, it's like, oh, there's a poster. And some girl that I worked with started working at the AGC. I said, do you still do graffiti? And I said, how long ago did I give you that poster? <laughs> she goes, oh, like four or five years. And I said, okay, cool. Well, I'm a lot better than I was then. Yeah. She goes, do you want to do a show at the AGC? And I said, oh, okay. What do you guys need? So I put them together with a bunch of artists from Canada and stuff, and we created this show called uh, um, Painting Under Pressure. And I think the name was changed to Art Under Pressure. That show was one of the biggest launches in Calgary's history. Over 600 people threw the private opening night on December 9th, 2005. I was like, what is happening? In May of that year, a man that graduated from ACAD, Tim Okamura, came to Calgary, walked into the gallery three days before the show was done, and looked at my piece and said, who is this kid? I can feel what he's doing. Who is this guy? I met him, and he's like, here's my card and my number. Come and do some stuff with me. And I said, okay. I was working at Holt Renfrew at the time. Great place. Met a lot of clients through that place. But I was working there, and I thought, this is it. This is, I'm making good money. Got a health care plan. I got dental. Got commission. A lot of beautiful ladies. Things are good. I was dating a girl for a long time and this and that. Just my brief history and what formed me into who I was. My relationship stopped. I got shingles. Anxiety went through the roof. $60,000 a year didn't mean nothing. Nothing. This artist contacts me. I was out of work and on sick leave for a long time. I was hurting. And the love of my life left. And I was like, what's going on? My whole world just crashed. And then all of a sudden, ba-boom, ba-bing, there I am. I'm quitting work. <laughs> the worst decision your parents can hear <laughs> ever. What are you doing? And dad just looking at me being like, what's up? So anyway, long story short, I went to my bank and I grabbed out all my RSPs and I looked at the banker and she goes, are you sure you want to do this? This is your retirement. I'm like, $4,000 is not a retirement. <laughs> yes, I'm sure I want to do this. Thank you very much. Very encouraged to jump forward into what I was doing. I had $25,000 worth of work. If anyone in here is an artist or creative and they understand this life, they'll understand that that $25,000 actually only means about five. A lot of talk. If that didn't stop me, I don't know what would. I kept pushing. I learned, how, I learned a, a, a really cool word when I was going through that. Resilience. And I use it to this day. I've been told more times than I've no than I've been told yes. More people have said no, you can't. My grade, nine math, my grade 9 math teacher said I'd amount to nothing more than a janitor. I believed him. I dropped out that year. But I can't listen to that. That's all part of the formation. Do you understand? Are you guys following me here? That's part of the formation of who you are. Your responsibility is to do something good with it or something not so good with it. Be a victim or rise up. How do you live out your dreams? How did I get to live out my dream? How do I get to daily live out my dream of sitting on my couch playing Xbox 360, going for coffees, encouraging friends, driving a Harley Davidson, taking road trips, rapping, doing my thing, whatever it is. How do I get to do that? You might think it's a foolish life and a fun-filled life. And Does he actually even work? I do work. I just decided to work for me. And my boss said, yes, I can come talk today. I get the, I get the day at the F series. This is great. Thanks, boss. It's awesome. If we live our greatest lives each day, what might that look like to you, to others, and to your community? How would you spend your life? Many of you are probably spending it in a really wonderful way. There's people here that I know that, that are doing things that encourage community and that encourage growth and that encourage all sorts of things. I was inspired by the first speaker, by Greg. I was blown away by it. I was like, wow, that is cool. I could not sit in a tube like that. No way. He can. That's amazing. I'm inspired by human beings. I love human beings. I love 
them and I also get really annoyed with them. Because in each one of us, there's something ticking and something happening. And we look at our lives as though they are forever and they're not. And we look at our time as though it's forever and it's not. And often when you're given a gift, you're given a gift and you say, well, how can I use this gift? Well, I'll use it for me. I'll build my life up. Sadly, what often happens is at 40, 50, or 60, the person goes, ooh, that wasn't the point, was it? No, that wasn't the point. And then they become givers, philanthropists. Sometimes earlier on. But the point of why you've been given what you've been given, if you pursue your passion, is not just for you. Yeah, you've got to build up a name. I had to build up my name as an artist. But it's for others. To encourage, to inspire, right? So how do you live out your dreams? In future, that's what we're always working toward. The future is never there. It's always there, but it's not. What happens when you wake up tomorrow? <laughs> it's today. Oh, Well, tomorrow I'm going to, it's today. Every day. No, next year I will. It's two things that are going to hold you back. Well, one thing that will hold you back and one thing that will push you forward. And it's really choice. There's no other way about it. I've had to go through a lot of hardship in my life, and I've realized that, ooh, I've made some poor choices. But I've made some great choices. In freedom or in fear is how you'll live your life. And too often you live it in fear. And I'm sick of living it in fear. Done. I hate it. And there's still fears. I am afraid to go to yoga. I don't know what's up with yoga. I'm afraid. Maybe it's the hot stuff and the sweating and the whatever that is. Maybe it's just showing people that can't even bend that well. But anyway, that's a huge fear. But I've done a lot of other things that blow people away. And they go, how do you do that? Talking up here, many of you are probably like, how do you talk in front of people? I don't know. You get nervous. And it turns into energy. It feels good. And you're grateful for the opportunity. So, you have two choices to live. You can live in freedom, and I believe that really centers in with the idea of love. Or you can live in fear. I've lived in fear for much of my life, and I'm tired of it. We should never stop the information stage of our lives. We should never stop that. I don't care how you're getting it, get information. But let it form you. Let it shape you. And that's not just with TV and media and all that kind of stuff. That's with people. That's with face-to-face -face conversation. That's with challenge. That's with people saying, mm, yeah, Dave, I don't really agree with this in your life. This doesn't really work. And you go, back gets up and you get all aggressive. And you're like, that's it. No, that's done. But no, it's, it's being humble. If there's one thing that being an artist will teach you, it'll teach you humility. Because... As much as your name gets big and your ego gets big and people want to shake your hand and talk to you at every show and your head spins off and everyone thinks you're doing drugs and you're like, what's happening? All that feels good. But those heights are followed by deep depths. So whether it's good or whether it's bad in all things, consider that it was made that way for you to learn from. You know? If... So if I ask you the question right now, if you lived out your greatest passion, if you took what was inside of you and stirring inside of you, how could you do that? That's such a huge question. You've got the comfort of downtown. You've got your marriage, and you've got your kids. Oh, my God, how do I do this? I just want to paint. I sit behind a desk and make $600,000 a year. How do I? S That's ridiculous. I can't do that. That's a lot of money. I'll switch your jobs. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I won't. Because that's not happiness for me. My happiness is to see you live out your passion and for me to live it out. It's not a pretty picture most days. Most days it's mundane. Most days it's doing what you talking to friends and, and having your friends hear you say, I don't get this. I don't understand what I'm doing. Is, am I ever going to be able to purchase a home? Will I ever retire? Am I just going to be one of those weird old dudes with super long hair that everyone's like, I remember when he used to be an artist, and now he's a hippie. I don't know what it is. But I want to break it down and just want to leave it with you this way, because if you are thinking this, 
and this is blowing you out of the water and you don't know how to deal with this. Break it into this. Big ifs are never conquered when we just put them out there. When you break it into smaller ifs, it helps you. Then you break it into another group of smaller ifs. If I woke up at 8 o'clock every morning, <laughs> if I won't, <laughs> but I do in the summertime, I get up at 6.30. If I stopped eating bread and pasta, which I've done, if I started juicing every day to get my body into good health, if I were to be a little more kind to the people that I love, if I were to turn off the TV, I haven't had cable for seven years now, if I were to listen and actually focus on somebody when I speak to them and look them in the eye, if I were to spend quality time with people that actually matter instead of trying to impress people that don't matter. Those are a bunch of if questions. Oh no, there's more. You're never going to fulfill the passion that's in your life. You're never going to answer the big if questions that drive you forward into what you want to do. Your most heroic, most brave, most amazing life. It could be as simple as me just talking. This could be the pinnacle of my life right now is talking to you guys. If that's what it is, that's great. But I didn't get there by just asking one if question. I got there by asking an if question every day. And because of it, I was able to get here today. And there will be a lot more. So this is your life to live, to live boldly and to live with courage and with strength if you choose it. Thank you very much.